Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Ratner. As part of our Mind-Body Connection series, we'll continue to look more deeply at the three columns and their corresponding action steps. Today I will look at the concept of black and white thinking, its usefulness, and when it should be applied. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and put your comments below, and I'll be happy to respond to you personally. In therapy and in life, we often promote shades of gray thinking. This is a good thing. It's nuance. It's taking the other perspective. It's having empathy for others. These are very good things, and it's the exact kind of thing we work on in therapy all the time. It's all good. But it isn't the skill set that helps with doubt. In fact, shades of gray thinking leads to more doubt. It promotes doubt. This is why we need a more flexible strategy of thinking about how we're going to deal with doubt. We need areas of our lives where we can finally be certain about something. To be able to fully put it to rest, you have to be certain. So I define doubt as, and this is not surprising, having a lack of certainty. That's the basic definition of doubt. Now, fear is another form of doubt. The questions you have are another form of doubt. Confusion, that's also doubt. How do we resolve it? The key to, to resolving doubt really is being able to have what I call black and white thinking. Uh, I wouldn't call it all or nothing thinking. Some people mix up the two. All or nothing thinking is exactly what it sounds like. You think one thing is all one way and not another. Black and white does have an element of that, but the reason that I distinguish between the two is that black and white thinking is more strategic. It's not as much a general state of mind. You choose when to decide something more fully. So black and white thinking, it can get a bad rap because when it's misapplied, it can be positively disastrous and extremely harmful at that. Think about it in terms of people you know. If you were to get mad at them and decide they're all bad. Now, I'm not, you know, it's interesting because historically the color black has been used for bad and white has been used for good. And obviously for racial reasons, that's a serious problem. But just for our, for our purposes, I'm just using that language in the typical way it's used colloquially. So if somebody is seen as all bad, that's kind of the black side of things. If somebody's seen as all good, it's the white side of things. So this can lead to terrible mistreatment uh, of between people. It can lead to some of the most cruel responses I've seen people had have. Meanwhile, it's also a, a, a leading cause of suicide is thinking in these all or nothing ways, especially, but even in black or white thinking to think, this is bad, so it means my whole life is colored by this bad thing. It's the kind of thing that can lead to very bad things. So I want to be very careful in how I'm recommending this. I'm talking about using black and white thinking in a very, very targeted way. One other example, actually, now that I think about it, a couple other examples. One, wars come from black and white thinking. That country is good. That country is bad. My country is good. Your country is bad. That's the classic thing that happens in wars. So th we need shades of gray thinking there. A lot of the time, especially with interpersonal stuff, we need shades of gray thinking. Lost relationships come from black and white thinking. Falling out, fallings out with friends, things like that, all come from black and white thinking. These are the bad sides of it. So when I'm talking about using it, I'm going to get very specific about how to do it. Especially... It's especially important when it comes to getting rid of toxicity in interpersonal relationships, but also in your relationship with yourself. We all have certain self-criticism or criticism that we perceive from the outside or even get from the outside that takes over and becomes black or white thinking. Um, what we need to do is distinguish when to use black or white thinking or not, because I've, I've seen this happen a lot where people get it into their their minds that they are supposed to be engaged in self-care. And instead of engaging in self-care, they use it as a blanket for aggression. This is what happens when people are thinking in black and white terms, but applying it badly. They're saying, I need something, and therefore I have a right to have it, and they don't think in shades of gray and nuance. Most of the time, I want you thinking in shades of gray and nuance. When it comes to symptoms, though, and when it comes to doubt, that's the time to use black and white thinking. So, again, all of the things I highlighted are the ways that black and white thinking can be misapplied. 
used wrong and not not for good. And I am definitely not advocating for black and white thinking being carried out in an interpersonal way at all. This is all about how you think inside of yourself. Black and white thinking is a way that you can categorize things in your mind. When it comes to the outside world, return to shades of gray. You need that. But when it comes to how you're going to deal with your symptoms or tormentors inside you, or even your own bad interaction with yourself, you may need to use black and white thinking. So I'm going to explain how that works. The thing about using black and white thinking on symptoms is nobody gets hurt if you apply black and white thinking just inside you. You're allowed to do that. Another way of saying it is that um, when I was growing up, it was often said in my family, there's no wrong feeling. This is definitely true, but it wasn't always actually enacted that way. I would hear there's no wrong feeling, and then I'd bring it out, and they'd say, oh, no, no, that's not okay. Well, that's because shades of gray thinking does belong in the interactions between people. You can have that feeling, and any feeling is fine to have. But a lot of times what's not explained is you want to have it in you, and that doesn't mean stuck in you and you're not going to let it out in any way or you're just going to deny it or pretend it's not there. You're going to use it. And I'm going to tell you how to use it. So the thing about black and white thinking and why it's useful for symptoms is that it involves certainty. And you need to be certain in a particular realm of yourself. You need to have a part of you that you can address and say, this is where I'm going to be certain. This is where I'm going to be certain, for instance, that I had this trauma. Or this is where I'm going to be certain that this person didn't respond in a way that was helpful to me. Or this is where I'm going to be certain that this is a mind-body issue and it is not a structural issue. We need to be able to find certainty, but we cannot do it if we are operating in shades of gray. In fact, the more evolved a person is with shades of gray thinking, the harder it becomes to conquer doubt. I've seen this all the time in the work that I do with patients. A lot of people get better from the emotional aspects of things, which prevents the onsets and upticks in symptoms, but they have chronicity because they can't get to a place where they don't have any doubt anymore. And why is that? Well, there can be many reasons, but one of them can be that they don't have it developed well in their minds how to use black and white thinking. One way that we need to know that we need to use black and white thinking is we don't use it for long stretches of time. If you use it for long stretches of time, you start to sink. You start to feel really bad about things. It, it paints too dark a picture of things and it gets upsetting. So what you want to do is dip into that and then bring back the shades of gray. But you do need to be able to dip in, especially when it comes to conquering symptoms. Let yourself get very black and white for a little bit. You got to let yourself get... Uh, what I would call primitive, because a lot of the feeling states that lead to the mind-body issues come from childhood. They come from a more primitive time. If we're always operating in shades of gray, we're trying to be too adult, and we can't access those emotions. So that's one way that black and white thinking helps in the emotional uh, column. It also should be used about very specific events, issues or traits. Um, but the thing is, and this is the reason we only use it for a brief amount of time. You need to allow it to color the whole picture. Here's an example. This is extreme, but I'm going to put it out there just so that you know what I'm talking about. You might be really angry at a family member. And you might need to, to get to the emotional theme and the emotions column, let in the full darkness of that picture. Something like, they wronged me so badly that I wish they would die. Now, of course, we're not going to carry that out, not only not in action attacking the person physically, but not even in words. But we do need to know about it. And you want to dip into that for the moment, you'll come back to shades of gray afterwards. We need to practice being able to dip into that black and white thinking. So the thing about black and white thinking when it comes to mind-body symptoms is it applies a huge amount of the time when it comes to symptoms. In the emotions column, it applies because it is the primitive, high-stakes experiences that tend to lead to the onset and uptick in symptoms. It tends to apply in the doubt column because it is the thing that is, is holding us back uh, from getting better. We have too much shades of gray when it comes to the doubt column. So 
In the emotions column, we have too much shades of gray to let in the full emotion. In the doubt column, we have too much shades of gray to be able to access and understand the nature of our doubt or do anything about it. And the same is true in the power column. We condemn our own power because we are afraid that the black and white thinking will overtake us. What I want to encourage you is do not be scared of black and white thinking. As long as you remember that there are shades of gray and you come back to it, you can dip into black and white thinking for a short amount of time. And remember, this is just ways of thinking. It's not how you act. But you do need to be able to have that mindset. Sometimes when I want to resolve an emotional issue, I think in black and white terms how mad I am. As an example, uh, when my daughters need me for something, I love going to my daughters for things. I love helping them with things. But sometimes I might be in the middle of something and then I'll have a symptom. And I need to be able to say... I'm so angry about this that I just wish that they were not here. Something like that. It's just a feeling. It's not how I actually feel about them. But I let myself dip into the black and white experience, knowing that I can come back out to the shades of gray thinking for other times. You also need to remember to look for big high stakes themes. This requires black and white thinking. You you can't get to the, the true high stakes feeling if everything's shades of gray because you're always bringing in um, you're always bringing in some sense of perspective. Just for a little bit, I want you to not bring in perspective. Just think about how bad it was for you or how big of a deal it was or how high stakes it was. Do not get caught up in the rationality of things when you're considering these themes. That is shades of gray thinking. Black and white thinking has no rationality. It just is what it is. And what we have to do is develop the ability to dip into it, knowing that we're going to come back out. Why is this so important? The reason this is so important is if you can't think in black and white terms, which is so interesting because in therapy, they basically teach us over and over and over not to. If we don't have that ability, we actually can't receive the body's message. Because the body speaks in black and white terms. It doesn't speak in shades of gray. It speaks to the truth, the, 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 the truth of the moment, the elemental truth within us. It comes from the primitive early childhood experience. There isn't shades of gray there. If we're truly going to hear what the body's going to say, we're going to need to speak the language of black and white thinking. It's often hard to use your emotions column well if you can't think in black and white terms. So that is one of the many reasons that I'm bringing this up. But then when we get to the doubt column, I talk about science and logic being the main weapons we used against doubt. Well, one of the great things about science and logic is they are a part of life where things can be black and white without it being a problem. You don't have to even return to shades of gray thinking. Does gravity exist? Yes. Black and white thinking... There's no shades of gray. Fine, you could say, well, if I'm on the moon, there's a sixth amount of gravity. It doesn't matter. Physics applies the way it applies everywhere in the universe. There's less gravity on the moon because of the gravitational pull. That's it. Everything works the same. So when it comes to science and truth and logic, that's all black and white thinking. So I guess my point is, it's wonderful that we have developed so many good pieces of shades of gray thinking it's much better for interpersonal things it's much better for subjective things but there are objective realities and a part of what we're trying to do in resolving symptoms is to get back to some objective realities of science and logic and truth reducing doubt is all about black and white thinking because there cannot be any any doubt left we have to know that there are facts and we have to know that there's logic that applies in a way that can resolve doubts. I'll give you an example. When people are saying, well, I don't know, this could be a mind-body symptom or it could be structural. And I say to them, well, how come it's moving around? That's a fact that you can't deny. And that's a fact that doesn't fit with structural theories. It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. To get over the doubt, you've got to use that black and white thinking. It's different than in the emotions column where you dip in and then come back out. In the doubt column, you can use black and white thinking on facts, science, and logic, and you don't ever have to come back out because it's true. As soon as it's settled for you, you're done. That's the great thing about black and white thinking in the doubt column. 
So I did want to say, it's interesting because these days society has a way of questioning even objective facts. And then there's also the problem of passing off opinions and beliefs as if they are facts. So we do have some other stuff that creeps in and causes some problem. But black and white thinking helps with science and logic conquering doubt because it there's nothing to argue with. You don't have to dip back out of it. But it can also help you with subjective emotional experience when channeled right. That's when you dip in, but you come back out. What's an example of that? One of my action steps, and this actually usually is applied in the, the power column, but sometimes in the emotions column too, is that you need to put the blame where it belongs about the traumas of your life. Now, what do I mean by that? This is a controversial one because a lot of people don't want to do this or they're not comfortable with the idea of blame. Well, that's shades of gray thinking right there, and I understand that. And in the long run, that's good. But in the short run, when you're trying to get to what emotion is causing this symptom, you're going to need to think in terms of black and white thinking. You're going to need to put the blame where it belongs. And this is controversial, but listen, I'm a parent, so I understand. I don't think it's fair to judge parents so harshly in a shades of gray, real world way. Being a parent is hard. There's all kinds of choices to be made. Most people are doing their best. These things are all true. But when it comes to your symptoms, that stuff is not true. What is true is the parent was the grown up. They had the best chance of doing the good job. And if something went wrong in your childhood that they could have done better, that's on them. Now that's a hard, that's kind of a harsh statement, but remember, that's an example of black and white thinking. I'm just gonna dip into it and then I'm gonna come back out. So for that moment, you don't need to empathize with the other person. You don't need to. That's shades of gray thinking. For that moment, you don't want to empathize with them. I have a rule of thumb when it comes to black and white thinking. You need to be fiercely in your own corner. That means no one else matters at that moment. Again, I'm never talking about action. Just talking about dipping in in the moment to yourself. No one else can matter at that moment. You need to be fiercely in your own corner about your truth. Trust only you. And when your body is aligned with you, you can trust it all the more. Your body's symptoms never lie. That's one of the great things about the body. They think, well, they, <laughs> bodies think in black and white terms or they're expressing our black and white feelings. If we speak that language, we'll get the message. We'll dip in and then we can come back out. Here's another piece of black and white thinking. Recognize that you didn't choose your path or who you are. That allows you to accept you more fully. It's only in the realm of black and white thinking that we can find that acceptance. In shades of gray, we're too busy cutting everybody a break. And, I, and that's a good thing, but not for this. For this, you don't want to cut anybody a break. You stay aligned to you. Let's also remember this. I say this a lot of the time, but I want to bring this up again. You are not the cause of your suffering, but you are the solution. So when you dip into black and white thinking, you can look at how other people and other situations and life in general caused your suffering. But now you get to eventually, once you come back out to shades of gray thinking, get to be your own solution. But in a way, black and white thinking helps you get to certain solutions and then you can move on. This is also another way that you channel your aggression. You're going to use your aggression as fuel to change the world or your world. But you can't do that if you're thinking in shades of gray and you're empathizing with everybody and you're taking everybody else's perspective. That is good emotional functioning, but you don't want to do it inside yourself at certain moments when you're analyzing things. So this is another reason that the core narrative is so important. The core narrative is an example of some black and white thinking in a way. It's true, so it's not, it's not really that skewed but it is very aligned with you, fiercely aligned with you. And it takes at least some measure of black and white thinking to develop it and then be able to hold on to it. We might polish it so it fits in in the shades of gray, and that's great. But we need black and white thinking to get there. Now I'm going to give you um, some examples of using black and white thinking and just so you can hear what it sounds like. And I want you to remember again, we're not acting this out with other people. This goes on inside ourselves. We're dipping into it, and then we're coming back out. But when you dip in, actually go in. Let yourself feel this. So 
As an example, if you were abused and not believed, you might say, I was abused and thrown away by the people who were supposed to love me because they did not choose to protect me or believe me. Do you hear how extreme that is? It's way too extreme for the interpersonal world. It's way too extreme for everyday thinking. But it's not too extreme when you had some overlapping experience in your present day that led to a symptom. Then you can actually think, mm, that, there's that black and white thinking, I'm so mad. And it can bring down the symptom because you get to dip into that territory. Here's another example. If you suffered at the whims of a narcissist, for example, you can say that person is so underdeveloped and horrible that they are not redeemable in any way and I am done spending even one more second on them. Again, do you hear how extreme it is? Doesn't fit in the outside world. It's not the kind of thing I'm recommending bringing to the table everywhere you go. But for a couple of minutes when you're trying to sort out your symptoms, that's the kind of place you need to go to sort this out. Um, when I had Nicole Sachs on for, for uh, her interview, I was uh, blown away by the fact that she brought up Sean, the therapist from Goodwill Hunting, because this is a therapist who I've always, therapist character, of course, who I've always loved. And the reason is he was a little more able to dip into black and white thinking. So I'm sure people who are familiar with it remember the scene when he says, it's not your fault. Well, as therapists, yes, we could say it's not your fault, but we don't say it as definitively as he said it. We would say more a shades of gray line, like you're blaming yourself for something that, you know, you didn't have anything to do with. It doesn't cut enough to it. it if you don't use the black and white thinking, the body doesn't feel it. The soul doesn't feel it. You've got to use the black and white thinking in there. So you might say instead, uh, as an example, if you feel you were undermining yourself at times, you might say, it wasn't my fault at all. You might play that role of Sean, the therapist, for yourself. It wasn't my fault at all. I was born into this situation and was taught not to protect myself or to feel valued. Now I will turn my back on anyone who stood in the way of my getting what I need. Hopefully, again, you hear how powerful that that can be. This is very extreme thinking, but you're not going to stay there. You're going there to deal with your symptoms. In the emotions column, you're going there to dip in and feel the full feeling because that will alleviate the onset or the uptake in symptoms. When it comes to doubt, it's important because you become very clear on things. And when it comes to power, it gives you the opportunity to become more powerful. So, I'm just going to do a little bit of review about how to use this because, I, as I said, I want to be very careful about this because shades of gray is very, very important for good living with each other. But black and white thinking is very important for resolving symptoms. So just make sure you only think this way with the right targets if you're going to say anything out loud because a lot of times people get wrong, wrongfully blamed and displacement is not fair. This is a big part of what happens when people say, well, I'm going to engage, I'm going to engage in some good self-care and I'm not going to let you push me around. A lot of times you're not getting pushed around by that person. You've displaced it. So just make sure you know your core themes and, and locate them in your childhood. That is mostly where these things come from. You also need to remember this is mainly a, a very quiet and personal exercise. It's really not for the outside world. A lot of the work that I do in mind-body work is about going within and changing the way we are thinking with ourselves so that we can become empowered. Uh, it's also not to be used to ruin goodest intentions. Uh, so I say this all the time. Goodest intentions, trying to do good all the time, that's good. We need that in the world. It is not mutually exclusive with being powerful. So you can go ahead and use your power and channel your aggression for good. That's the way to use black and white thinking well. You dip into it, and you draw a conclusion that you can be certain about. And then you go live in a really good shades of gray kind of way. But you live very powerfully that way. Lastly, it is good for you to honor what your whole body knows is true. And make changes, at least inside yourself, accordingly. You might even make some changes outside. 
maybe a toxic personality, you decide, I can't have them in my life anymore. You could ha make those changes, but you don't have to do them forcefully or in a way that makes somebody necessarily feel all that bad. It's all about getting it settled with you. So I hope this was a helpful video in helping you all think through how to use this part of the psyche that often is condemned and not used. And I have seen that it has led to major problems for me. I operated in shades of gray for 20 years of therapy and I spun around in circles. It was only when I used black and white thinking in a very channeled way that I finally got where I needed to go. So if you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below and I will answer you directly. Thank you for watching.